pretty um, high incidence of developing hypothyroidism. In other words, where your thyroid gland stops working. Um, and this requires thyroid replacement during the time that you're, you're on the sunitinib. So we monitor that very closely and we draw thyroid tests before starting the treatment so we get a baseline blood level and then every six weeks we always uh, test the blood again for its thyroid to see if it's uh, becoming hypo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about taking um, other kind of supplements, vitamins, while on these drugs? Um, are there any that really should be avoided or how, you know, maybe discuss the importance of discussing of what else you might be taking with your physician? Well, you know, I think we, we, we have a, a nice service at our facility in that if um, patients are taking complementary medications or herbs, uh, our pharmacy department will run through and um, see you know, if you give them the list of the medications that you're on, if, if they're compatible with the sunitinib or the Nexavar or whatever you're on. I, I don't even have the background to be able to answer these questions, but our pharmacy does, which is very nice. Um, if patients are clinical trials, for the most part, we don't recommend it because these are new agents that we don't have, know all the side effect profile and we're learning about. So I think it's much better to be cautious rather than to take these medications together um, because what could happen is an increase in side effects. But, you know, Perhaps you should inquire about that at your um, pharmacy at, at your hospital to see if they have that service, and then they can tell you what drugs are compatible. Um, do you, um, I guess, think when, when patients have very severe side effects, um, is the, the first step typically decreasing the dosage levels? Um, is there kind of a time frame in when the doctor would, would play around with the, the dosage levels before switching to another treatment or stopping? The treatment altogether? Well, if a patient's having you know, a significant side effect, we really don't play around. We stop the drug um, and let the patient recover. And then we, you know, our goal would be to restart at a lower dose and you know, try to keep the patient on the medication for as long as possible and you know, keep the schedule going for their regular scans. Um, and, and that's our goal. If we can't meet that goal, then we need to start thinking about other medications, but we really don't jump into that, you know, until we've we've kind of tried everything that we know um, that we can do to keep the patient on. Okay. Um, if maybe you could talk a little bit, Nancy, um, just about kind of now that we've got all these therapies, um, what kind of maybe the future of this disease, if they're a little bit about clinical trials, how they could learn more about that, um, maybe just sure. kind of an overview of that. Uh, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think that clinical trials are still extremely important um, in the treatment of kidney cancer. And, you know, if we didn't continue to have clinical trials, we would never be able to advance our knowledge and um, look what we've accomplished in the past five years. So. I think that um, participating in clinical trial is a really good thing. And when you, it, well, when you go to a second opinion or you're, you know, you're being treated at an academic center, you know, one would hope that your doctor would have a kind of an arsenal of clinical trials for his patients where you have some studies that are aimed at first-line treatment, studies that are aimed at second-line and then, you know, some really interesting new phase one studies that have new molecules so that we're constantly providing patients with the um, most appropriate and cutting-edge treatment and at the same time answering questions and keeping knowledge moving forward. So that, that's kind of how I see the role of clinical trials um, in, in this disease. And, you know, it, it's just been an explosion in terms of the amount of information you know, we've learned about kidney cancer and, um, and the treatment in the past few years. Um, do you think there's any sort of um, maybe top questions or things that a patient should um, 
consider when talking to their doctors about maybe which drug to start with or what might be best for them since there are so many now for kidney cancer patients? Well, I, I think that you have to be extremely comfortable with the rationale for, you know, why your doctor has prescribed the given medication that he or she has prescribed. And then you've got to be certain that they're giving it to you in the right dose and on the right schedule. Um, it's that everyone's getting all these drugs on the right dose and the right schedule, but they're not always. So, you know, that's where, you know, you need to do your homework, and there's certainly a lot of information available, and, um, you know, asking the right questions and just, you know, making sure that you're on, you know, the appropriate dose and the appropriate schedule for your given type of, of cancer and, and ask the questions why, you know, why this is being prescribed because the answers are there. Okay. Um, what about um, you, I guess, um, at what point do do patients, you know, decide that they act, they do need to be on one of these therapies? Is there a certain tumor size um, that that affects when when the therapy should be started or when, that when therapy? Those, yeah. Well, um, let me just say that there is no proven treatment for when a patient has their kidney removed and there's no cancer elsewhere. So even though we have clinical trials trying to identify if treatment at that point in time is even beneficial, there's nothing that's been demonstrated yet. So if you have your kidney removed and there's no evidence that the, the disease is elsewhere, short of a clinical trial, you won't be given any treatment. Certainly when um, a disease becomes apparent on CAT scans, that's generally the time to start treatment. Um, sometimes patients can be followed over the course of time with very, very, very small lesions, whether it be in the lung or, you know, or the liver, but it, primarily it's, it's the lung. And if they're very small and they're not fast growing, sometimes we do hold off on starting treatment in a patient. But if, if, if the lesions are about a centimeter or larger, then we, then we generally have discussions with patients about, um, you know, starting uh, some type of systemic therapy. Okay. Um, question as to some the signs of toxicity with any of these drugs. It, what, the question is what? Uh, what, what, is, what would be the signs of toxicity? With any of these drugs? Yes. Well, it would be somebody not having a, a very severe hand foot where they couldn't 